came across an interesting Dharma talk by John Sawat. in which he reverses the usual order for spreading thoughts of goodwill. He says, first you start with other people. You're planning to sit down and meditate. You don't want thoughts of issues from the day to get in the way of your meditation. So you clear the decks. Remind yourself you're here to have no ill will for anybody. If any thoughts of it will come up in the course of the meditation, you've prepared for them. You've thought about it. What does ill will accomplish? Nothing at all. The desire to see somebody else suffer. Part of the mind may say, it will be good for them. But how many people really respond well to suffering, to pain? The usual reaction is to find a scapegoat outside. That doesn't help. What you want is for them to understand the causes for true happiness and be willing and able to act on them. No matter how impossible that thought may seem in the case of some individuals, at least you have that attitude toward them. Because that's the best way out of a lot of the suffering in the world. You don't have to settle scores. Because if you start tracing back, who knows where things started? There's a famous story about Sipnet Do. A young monk came to see him one time, complained that another monk had hit him. And somebody told, looked at him and said, well, you hit him first. And the young monk said, no, he just came up and hit me out of nowhere. No, you hit him first, back and forth like this. The young monk got frustrated and went to find another senior monk. To complain about some dead doe now. The other monk came and asked some dead doe what that was all about. And some dead doe said, well, obviously he's got some karma in the past. But then, of course, the question of who hit whom first, that's really unanswerable. You can trace things back through many, many lifetimes, and you lose track of who's playing which role. And the whole idea of settling a score becomes meaningless. And you can have that attitude. Say the best way out of that kind of back and forth is to just get out with goodwill. And then, as John Swart would say, you turn the goodwill on yourself as you're sitting here meditating. Just think of it, you're here learning how to breathe in a way that feels really good. Have some goodwill for the breath, goodwill for yourself. Be happy when the breath is comfortable. When it's not comfortable, show some compassion. Try to figure out why. Is it the fact that you're putting too much pressure on it? Are you focusing in the right place or the wrong place? What perception of the breath do you have in mind? Is there a perception that can make things easier? We talked about the perception of a sponge, where the breath can come in and out of the body from all directions, and you're aware of the whole sponge. There's nothing in the way. You can also remember that of the various elements in the body, the breath is first. So if it runs into a pain, don't think of the pain being able to hem the breath in. The breath is there first. The breath can penetrate anything. If there's a feeling of pressure someplace in the body, that's not breath, that's the blood or the lymph being pushed around. Those liquids run up against the, the solid walls of the blood vessels, the lymph vessels. That's why there's pressure. But breath is different. It can flow between atoms. Hold that perception in mind. 
see if it helps make, make the breath easier. Otherwise, you don't just sit there with an uncomfortable breath. You're trying to figure out what the, you can do to make the breath better. And that's the way you show compassion. Then when the breath does go well, you stick with it. May you not be deprived of the good fortune you have attained. Think that. You've got the breath going well now. Stay with it. Protect it. Hover around it. That's empathetic joy. And then there's equanimity, the times when nothing seems to work. Now, it doesn't mean you give up. It means if you're going to figure out a solution, you have to be very calm about the whole thing, not get upset. Remind yourself that we all have karma. And maybe there are some times when nothing's going to seem to work. And so what do you do? You take your safe attitude, which is, you're going to watch, you're going to learn. That attitude can help you through a lot of difficulties. Remind yourself, after all, someday you're going to have to die. And ideally, you can have to approach death with equanimity, too. Accept the fact that what's happening by realizing that there's work you can do. You don't just give up at that point. There are choices that are going to be made, and that have long-term repercussions. So you want to be able to make the mind as calm and as steady as possible, and then watch. And see if you can catch something you never noticed before about the way you're breathing, about the way you're talking to yourself, about the perceptions you hold in mind, the way you relate to your feelings, all these forms of fabrication. The Buddha lays them out as a list of alternatives. If something's going wrong, it's with one of these. Which is it? And if you've run through your repertoire of different ways of breathing and of different ways of talking to yourself and different perceptions to hold in mind and nothing seems to be working, Watch. And be okay with watching for a while. You learn a lot of lessons about the Brahma Bahars in, in this way. One of the most important ones is equanimity is not when you give up. It's when you realize you don't see a solution to a particular problem. And you have to watch it to see if there's something you don't see. That attitude is useful all around. Because if we simply want things to be the way we want them to be, there's a lot we're not going to see. All we see are our desires and the things going against our desires. But if you can remind yourself there's a lot you don't understand. And how are you going to understand those things? Well, you watch. Pose a few questions in the mind. And this is what the Buddha's teachings are good for. They give you some ideas about what are good questions. His teaching is not the sort of teaching that tried to nail things down for you. Or give you potted answers, every question. See, so the things you're going to have to learn, and you're going to have to learn how to learn. You start out by asking questions. You get some idea of which questions are useful and which ones are not. And learn to ask some unexpected questions. Like when there's a pain it seems to be in the chest. Is it really in the chest? What if it's a pain in the back that you've gotten mislabeled? What would happen if you relabeled it? When the breath comes in, does the breath energy come in, or is it just the air that comes in? The breath itself 
doesn't originate outside. The breath energy, it originates in the body. Can you switch your focus to see where it emanates from and to make sure that it doesn't run into any restrictions as it spreads through the body? And how are you relating to the breath? Breath instructions often begin by saying, watch the breath. But that can create some problems. You tell yourself, don't watch the breath, feel it, wear it, bathe yourself in it. After all, we're dealing with proprioception. And the breath is not in front of your eyes. If anything, it's behind him. So back into the breath. See what that perception does. So the watching does involve some experimenting and asking yourself, is there something I haven't seen before? Is a question I haven't asked? And be very quiet. And remind yourself, we're not here to have a pleasant meditation all the time. We're here to have meditations where you learn. And if you can learn from when it's pleasant, that's fine. But if you can learn from pain, learn from a mind that's not willing to settle down quickly, that's even better. Because it means you take the right approach no matter what. If you have this inquisitive attitude, that goes along with the equanimity. If you have this inquisitive attitude, you're a moving target. The pain can't catch you. Or at least it can't catch you quite so easily. If you just sit there and take it, take it, take it, you're just simply putting yourself in the line of fire. So that's another lesson to learn about equanimity. It goes along with being inquisitive. It's not, I don't care, it's, I don't understand, and I want to find out. That kind of equanimity will take you far. So you learn a lot of lessons about the Brahma Viharas by applying them to the breath as you're sitting here. You bring lessons in from outside, and then you gain more lessons inside, and you can take those lessons out and apply them outside as well. And the benefits go all around.